Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Santos. Uh, I work at Cell Focus, and uh, I'm currently a data scientist at Cell Focus. Uh, my main interest is trying to bring the, to bring the fundamental uh, machine learning and AI into the IT network operations. Um, I come from an academic background. Uh, I was for 12 years a researcher at a university. So I was digging deep into the artificial intelligence and I saw an opportunity to bring uh, value into the IT uh, industry. So it's customary to put a fun fact. So <laughs> during my lifetime in Coimbra, I developed some kind of intolerance to whiskey and gold strike. This is probably when I decided to become a data scientist. So this is my fun fact. Although my life is full of fun facts. And they also asked me to bring a uh, some kind of inspirational quote. So I usually treat my team members as decision trees and my team as a random forest. So for you, for you guys in data science, this will, try, this will make some sense. So uh, I'm going to start by introducing Cell Focus a little bit because this is a, a landing festival from landing jobs and probably some of you are here uh, seeking for jobs. So let's see if I can push you in uh, Cell Focus. So Cell Focus is a joint venture between Novavaz and uh, Vodafone. Uh, Vodafone is our preferential customer, but not the only one. And we started solving CSP business challenges since 2000. We are divided into five main axes. Our most classical are uh, business support systems and operational support systems. And now we are entering the world of IoT and digital television and also unified communications, which is where we have our uh, best-selling product, let's say. And our global footprint spans from uh, Europe, and we also have some presence in uh, Brazil and uh, Africa and uh, in Asian, uh, South Asian. So this is who are we, but lately we have been, as I, as I told, uh, entering the world of IoT and uh, data science, and we have identified three main profiles that we are looking for. Data engineering are the people who handle systems, make installations of big data frameworks and manage uh, all the data transformations that occur uh, at hardware level from database to database until we get our data. Then we also have data analysts, which are typical BI people. Uh, they, are, they also play a very important role because it's a very huge challenge to try to uh, translate machine learning insights into business knowledge and value. So this is an open challenge because most of traditional BI is not equipped nor handling uh, properly the visualization of machine learning results. And then we have data scientists. This is where I, uh, where I belong. Uh, we are called the dreamers. Um, I've seen a lot of people presenting themselves as data scientists. I see a lot of people that are users of data science. For me, data scientist is someone that has the ability to translate the mathematical concept into a top management in a way that they clearly understand. And the majority of people that I go through uh, that are the so-called data scientists, they are simply users of data science. They take stacks of machine learning. They know how to use it. But sometimes when things fail, they do not understand why those things fail. So there is a misconception that deep learning will solve all the problems in the world, which is not true. Deep learning is not even the ideal methodology to make decisions. There are other types of things. And this is a misconception because most of the people that go to interviews to be a data scientist, they just read a lot of things in Wikipedia. And most of the, if you write something about machine learning in Wikipedia, you will get deep learning. And they don't even know what that is. So we are really interested in people who want to know what uh, algorithms do, how they do it, so that they can correctly explain and solve problems with them. So below are some of the partners and technologies that we use. We are now uh, very deep into big data frameworks and, and all the, the big data machine learning supporting uh, stacks, uh, such as Cloudera, which supports Scala ML, which is the library that correctly maps scikit-learns framework into uh, a Java-oriented language that is proper to, that is, uh, uh, that properly addresses machine learning in big data context. So, but I am here to talk a little bit about one 
uh, current problem that we are addressing uh, at Cellfoco, just to try to explain you from end to end what are the challenges in machine learning that we are facing, and to show you that they are horizontal, they cover horizontally all the system from the system, from the data ingestion into the decision making. So, there is this big uh, room which is called Network Operations Center. The people that sit in this room are a lot of people. They are constantly monitoring all the insights and all the data in dashboards. And their responsibility is to make sure that the antennas and all the network equipments and all the network, the, the framework that supports your communications is running smoothly. They are responsible for maintaining service level agreements and all of those things. But uh, this is at the uh, local level. Then we have global network operations center. It means that we might have someone in a network operations center in one country addressing problems in network elements in another country. And this exponentially um, makes the problems and challenges grow. And this is something that artificial intelligence and machine learning can help. And this is what brought Cell Focus to address this problem. So what are the challenges and what, the, what is the vision that we had when we started this, this project, because we started the project to address a problem, but we have a vision of the problems that will come ahead. And the main problem is 5G is coming. In three to five years, we will have 5G. And 5G is a technology that will increase uh, network heterogeneity. So we go beyond the classical 2G, 3G, and 4G into 5G. And there will be an exponential data throughput increase. So the volume of data flowing through the network is going to grow exponentially. And this means all your devices, all your things are going to get connected through this network. And this poses another problem, that the support paradigm and the, is going to change completely because we go from classical hardware managed equipment to virtualization and managing virtualized environment is a completely different task from managing classical uh, support in the technologies that are currently in production. And it will increase the support needs. And this is a problem, because the fact that you have a new technology does not mean that you will have new customers. You will have the same customers with a new technology. This means that you will need support for this new technology, but not a new revenue to support it. So we need for we need somehow to automate the process of uh, handling this new network paradigm. We also want to make effective use of big data. Everyone, everyone here knows what big data is. It's just loads and loads of data flowing through all the devices into, all, uh, into, all, into the network. But truth be told, nobody has a clue of what to do with it. So one of the, one of the biggest challenges is to focus on the relevant info which means that in order for you to have smart insights and intelligent and personalized insights, you will need to find the needle in the haystack. So it's very, it's very difficult, and you will need machine learning to, uh, to do it, because in one terabyte of data, you will need to find that single line that will give you a critical insight to solve some kind of problem. Also, decision making promotes the, the automation of incident troubleshooting. So decision making, and don't, don't get me wrong, I love deep learning, but deep learning is not a decision making uh, methodology. There are tons of decision making methodologies, and they promote automation because if you decide right, then automating is just operationalizing what, whatever you want to do to the network, but your decision needs to be the correct one because business is intolerant to wrong decisions. And also techniques like, like deep learning, and I say like deep learning because there are others, uh, will allow us to predict and prevent incidents. So let's say that you have a, a network element that is having the, a regular problem like every week. And then the periodicity goes from a week to every, every other day. This means that it is very likely that that, net, that network element will fail. And if we are able to predict it, then we can predict the network failure, and then we will save uh, the IT company some money. So this is what we want to do to make effective use of big data. And we need to be cost efficient. As I told, new technology does not, need new does not mean new customers. So we need uh, AI to regulate operational costs. 
This is mandatory for survival, because if every time we introduce a new technology and we need to have operational costs without having new customers, this means that soon, when we get to 7G or 8G, we will be bankrupt. So AI needs to take over control. And this is also something that I, I see regularly. I see IT industry now motivated to, re, to requalify their human resources. So they want to have that classical engineer that just turns both and clicks the button into something more productive that gets more progressively modern, that can handle problems like doing functional analysis, design of new things, of new requirements, new needs for the operational context so then that other people like data engineers, data scientists, uh, can implement those needs. So also AI is forcing the IT industry to requalify itself in their work labor. So this is something also that human resources that are at a specific um, uh, doing specific jobs in the IT industry should look at these opportunities to requalify themselves. So, what is the new, the, the current paradigm? So, when you have a, a network operation center, you have someone, you have hundreds of people monitoring all the alarms that flow through the, uh, the network. And then, when they detect an incident, which, which usually takes about 15 minutes to identify and diagnose an incident, they go to the troubleshooting, if they solve, or if they are not able to solve it by their own, they need to dispatch it to other teams, which are regularly called second line and field engineers, and sometimes third line. They have to follow up with an external network, which connects to external tools of uh, CRM, so change, change request management, and all those things that they need then to confirm resolution. And this is a very complex process and may involve multiple teams of NOC experts. And as you see, it's a very time-consuming process. This means that from detection to resolution, our experience tells us that even in simple problems, it involves human operators at all stages. And this is not good, because if we add a new technology, we need to add another team of humans, and this will soon be unsustainable. So we want to move to a new paradigm, that is to mitigate the need for network operational support. We want people that work in network operation centers to monitor automation and assist automation because we don't want to fall in that cave where we say that machines will replace humans. No, machines will, my experience tells, tells me, that the humans will always be needed to support machines into doing their jobs. So we need to assist automation. So NOC not, uh, not experts will support automation but focus on critical problems. So AI and machine learning are not one size fits all. They cannot handle everything. There are so-called outliers, and these outliers usually are very critical problems that uh, teams have to handle. And we need those experts to focus their attention and their strength into these problems. So AI, uh, AI has a supportive role in their job and not replacing them in their job. And also this is, I wanted to talk a little bit about active learning processes. So, one of the odd trends now is AI governance. AI governance means that we need to see if the model is still valid, when do we need to retrain the model? Should it be done automatically? Who should uh, monitor this, this AI governance? And also there is one very hot topic that is data protection and data privacy. Models are built on top of data that might or might not be private. And we need to integrate all these concepts and all these uh, governance uh, context into the AI governance. So, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the solution that we came up for this network operations center, okay? This is a very light overview uh, where we have the network and we have the part that senses. Then we have a reasoning layer which makes decision as reference knowledge and as the ability to learn. And then we have the execution layer. So from someone that comes from robotics background, this is fairly simple to me. We have a sensing, we have reasoning, and we have actuation. And the actuation is the execution. And then we have two distinct layers that uh, interact and inform. Interact with the operational part. These are the humans that need to help the automation, that need to help and support the decision systems. And then, we also have the management. Management always likes to see AI as a big trend and wants to keep an eye on what we are doing. So 
management, management is informed through a visual interface or a, some kind of visualization interface about everything that the AI, the AI is doing. And this is, for me, an open problem because there has not yet been uh, enough research dedicated to the visualization of machine learning in order to translate those findings into top management. And sometimes uh, it's really needed. So a little bit into a superficial deep dive. We have the eyes. We collect data from network, and every day we have a batch process processing it and updating the model. And we have the real time because uh, at the end of the day, we need to react as fast as possible and to overcome all the problems. So we have a speed layer based on a, uh, on a big data stack framework, which uh, is ingesting alarms in real time and making decisions in real time so that the time from detection to solution is not, does not uh, uh, go beyond 10 to 15, to 15 minutes, which is already faster than what humans do. Then we have the brain. The brain is where we have the data lake. We store all data. Uh, we have an analytics repository, which is where we store some rules and some, uh, some rule-based information which feeds the machine. We have the machine learning repository with machine learning algorithms. This is where we version our models and we see what worked, what did not work, and we know which version of the model went, uh, performed correctly or not. We have an operational repository where all the data belonging to the, to the operations and all the interactions with human users is recorded. And we also have a decision engine because, well, sometimes we cannot learn everything by ourselves. Rule-based decision and uh, human-given rules, it's something that is also part of artificial intelligence. Sometimes I see a lot of people resisting this concept, but rule-based is also artificial intelligence. And then we have the automation platform, which is responsible for interfacing with human interaction. It's responsible for connecting to network elements to do troubleshooting, and we have all the network automation and the OSS automation. And on the top, we have the operations portal. We have developed the portal that uh, uh, supports different types of users, and each different type of user has access to different types of information according to its role so that we don't overload humans with information that they don't, simply they don't care about. So this is more or less uh, the concept of our um, network automation uh, system that we have developed during this particular project. But let me talk a little bit, and this is uh, where I want to spend a little bit more time about the challenges related to artificial intelligence and machine learning that we found out during this whole process. So how to decide? We need to map human to machine decisions. This is the first, uh, the first thing that we needed to do. And luckily, it's an unsupervised process. We didn't know what to do. How to do it? They just give us a lot of data, and we need to make decisions based on this data. So we went through unsupervised techniques to try to identify patterns in the alarmistics so that then we could actuate on top of the network. And, uh, but truth be told, we had some assistance from first line uh, to give them some kind of rules, typical problems. And then we developed our own algorithm, and we uncovered insights that first line didn't know about. So on top of everything that they gave us, we, our algorithm was able to identify new rules, new diagnoses that were uh, unknown to them, and that made some sense, and that they needed to be automated. So this is some kind of, uh, this is where machine learning can really contribute. But we need to do it reliably and robustly. So business, as I told, is mostly intolerant to fail. So our algorithms, we need to spend a lot of time to do a lot of tests, a lot of reconfiguration, because they don't allow for errors. I'm just going to confess a, a, a short story. I had to classify uh, around 40,000 um, data uh, sentences. And I classified correctly all my samples but one. And I went to the business and I said, is it possible that we don't have that one error? And me, coming from an academic background, I thought to myself, 
If I write an article where I have 39,999 correct classified samples from my test data set and only one error, I'm like a god in the machine learning uh, field. But for those guys, it's impossible to have that error. So we need to come with ways to overcome that error. Another thing that is really interesting is outliers. So we worked on something that is AI-enabled ETL process. Uh, we wanted to handle unpredictable human errors because sometimes network elements are not configured by the provider, by the service provider. They are configured on site by humans. And sometimes our system needs to have deterministic information to make decisions because it is a rule-based decision. So we needed to find a way to correct these errors. And we needed to correct these errors with 100% precision. So this is the challenges that we are currently facing. There is a lot of resistance to errors, and they think that machine learning is something that is 100% reliable, which is not. And it's very hard for us to explain this to them. We also have AI governance. The algorithms that we developed regularly propose new addition of new classes, of new things, and that they need to be validated by the business side, but they can do it autonomously. They just present it, and uh, we can say, should we add this class to our learning? And the algorithm has that ability, and that is also a challenge. Then we have the anomalies. We want to converge to human expertise. Someone came to me and asked, we want to detect anomalies. And I said, what anomalies? Well, anomalies. And I said, OK, let's detect anomalies. And uh, they need to converge to human expertise. It is a totally unsupervised learning process. We became with an heuristic because we can have uh, robust autoencoders to identify anomalies. This is something we could discuss because I love to discuss mathematics. But we can, we can use this kind of techniques to identify outliers. But why was this critical? It was critical because the algorithms that we developed showed that we have a positive correlation above 95% with uh, anomalies identified by human beings. And this was a surprise. But we moved beyond human processing capabilities. We could detect 10 times more than a team of humans. So it's something that is critical for us to know that we can, AI can move beyond human capabilities. We can detect it faster and in more quantity. And this is what is coming with 5G. So this was a very good, uh, was a very good uh, benchmark for the future uh, path that we see in, uh, in our company. And also, it enables optimal framework performance. These anomalies were not supposed to be handed over by automation. If they were, they would flood the network with commands that would probably let the whole network to get stuck or to get delays and to breach uh, service level agreements. And because we have this uh, anomaly detection preventing these cases from going to the automation, then we are, in fact, enabling optimal uh, framework performance. And at the end, our biggest challenge, where is the value? We need to convert machine learning performance into benefits that top management can understand. We need to bridge the gap between two different worlds. My language is different from management language, OK? So it's, it's very difficult for me. It was a challenge for me when I arrived to the company to try to explain the benefit of a machine learning algorithm to the top management. But how did we do it? We associated classical performance metrics to value. We mapped uh, a currency percentage to an amount of time that first line would save by handling these problems. And this is not an easy, it is not an easy thing to do. You need to stop, you need to think. It was, I can tell you, that was a two-week work for me, sitting and going through numbers and mathematics into assembling one equation that I could put in front of top management that they could understand. And I see, if I have 95% of precision in my algorithm, this will translate into, seven, into one hour per day of two engineers that I saved. And this is critical to show the value. And lastly, we need to educate. This is why I think we don't need only users of machine learning in the companies. We need people that really want to understand the mathematical fundamentals behind the algorithms. Because this is key. This is really key for you to educate. And to educate top management, it's a pain. I can tell you it's a pain. I've been in, uh, I'm, I'm known as being a very, I don't know, I ignite very easily. I get upset very easily. So 
when someone makes me questions that for me are obvious to answer, I took three to four months into learning to maintain my calm when I'm talking to some types of people because it's very hard for me not to explode. So, uh, right now I, we are going to, into the benefits. Uh, I'm I have five minutes still, so I'm still on track. So, we, we reduced the time uh, of reaction, dispatching, and resolution. So, this translates into service availability, this translates into customer satisfaction, and into the reduction of call deflection rates. This also translates, and don't get me wrong, machines will not replace people, but will replace some tasks that some people do. So we reduced manual effort. There are uh, some engineers that don't need to now do knock operations because we have automation doing that for them, so that they can do other things that are more critical for the company. And also, we, we, we also work on resource optimization. So we can maximize resource allocation, we have a lot of data, and we are establishing the ground to move further. So what we want is to move further, to find new challenges and to find new applications. But this was a really great use case to start showing top management of IT companies that machine learning can really be an asset that is worth investing on. Now I'm going to talk, I said five minutes, uh, to talk a little bit. Uh, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, I will have to speed up through this part, but this is a very dear theme for me because I come from artificial intelligence applied to societal challenges. So digital healthcare, the age of IoT health. 5G will bring all the devices, your smart bracelets, connecting your iPhones, your uh, devices at home, your tablets, your computers, everything will be connected. And we should start moving from operations into digital healthcare. And this is, not, this is a societal obligation for us all because our healthcare system is defaulting. And it's our obligation to try to support this. And we should put our brains and our efforts into this team. This is at least my personal belief. Uh, of course, they will tell you, well, our health records should be private. Our information must be private. So why not apply big data and blockchain and we build health record security? It's big data, why not do it? So this is something we should clearly be investing on. Okay, and this is the future. If we don't do it, someone will do it and they will make billions out of it. So we should start in paying attention to this. And also, I really love this, this, uh, this hot word, value-based care. We should move into value-based care. Big data, we should make health care in real time. If we have, uh, I have my parents living alone in a city far away from here, and I want to know if they are okay. Why can't I have a fitness reset and monitor their uh, health status from beyond? And I don't even need to be invasive. I just need to know if they are okay or not. And this is not so hard to do, and we should be investing in solutions like this. Because we would like to build an omniscient health landscape. What do I mean with this? This also triggers and enables new businesses. Imagine that in the 80% of people in Lisbon would have fitness bracelets and we could monitor their health status in real time. We could have a, a global health landscape that will tell us, well, that pharmacy needs uh, more pills for heart diseases because on that region, most of the problems are, respect, uh, are related to heart diseases. So this could also optimize uh, allocation of medicine in pharmacies because we all know that hospitals and pharmacies are also defaulting because they don't have time, they don't have money to buy uh, medicine, the correct medicine. They are sometimes lacking provision of some, type, some, some types of medicine. And also, this information could be sold to the government, which in terms of health, usually as money, which is also good. And we need to start thinking about reshaping telecommunication business. All this data that is going to flow about your health, about, um, about your uh, lifestyle, about your routines, about your communication patterns, is flowing through IT industry. Network communications are the pool where all this information lives. So we should start thinking instead of receiving marketing messages, why don't you buy this new plan with five gigabytes of data? Why not? You have heart disease. Why don't you go to this hospital? Why don't you call, why don't you do remote care? Why don't you 
why don't you do some kind of health insurance that is specific to you? So if we are doing marketing and we are selling entertainment through telecommunications industry, why not leverage on the information that will flow through this network into making new business opportunities? So this is the final message that uh, I, would, uh, I would like to bring to you here. And uh, start thinking about, we all see uh, robotics as a service. We all, we all see everything as a service. We're not, why not selling through companies, monitoring as a service? If I want to know that my parents are, are okay, I could have some, my IT provider telling me automatically that they need help without they even need to know about it. So thank you very much for attending this talk. And if you have any questions, I think we have 30 seconds, so be fast. So this is good because data science doesn't usually trigger too many questions. You have a question? Yes. If my parents, <laughs> if my parents were sick, um, yeah. you will, you would inform. But there is privacy issues. This is why I talk blockchain uh, into securing our data. But imagine that. I buy a service from an IT provider that I really want to know if my parents are all right. And there are ways of doing non-invasive monitoring. And we can discuss for one hour about this. There are ways of monitoring non-invasively the health of a person. And I just want to know if they are okay or not. Because imagine, uh, my mother is alone at home and she falls during the night. I will have to wait Well, I go home by every two months. So when I go home, I will find her dead. Why can't I have a service that will prevent me from doing this? This will make me feel safer, and this will make her feel safer. So if we agree and sign in on terms and conditions like everybody does on Google, then it's OK, because I allowed it. And I want to do it. I want to know it. Do you know that in Europe, the cause for, uh, for most elderly accidents is falling. Did you know? Most of the accidents in, with elderly people living alone at homes is fall. And during the night, when they need to get up and go to the bathroom, and they fall, and they are terribly scared about this. So if you give them a service that will trigger automatically help if they fall, they will embrace it with all their hearts. And privacy will not be an issue because they will have no problem in signing in anything that they will help us to have a better life quality.